All right. Kids, we'll get started here on 5.3 today. Calculus 5.3 Optimization uh, is the title. And uh, this is going to kind of be a section similar to the first one in Chapter 5 that we talked about. Uh, again, we're going to talk about what derivatives mean and, and, and why we take them. But uh, 5.3 is going to be mostly a focus on f prime of x more than it is f double prime of x. We're going to be talking about first derivatives and we're really going to be focusing on setting first derivatives equal to zero uh, and what they mean. Again, uh, if you remember 5.1 we talked about critical points, either local maximums or local minimums within a um, function. So uh, we're going to be looking at that type of stuff again. So the objectives we're trying to accomplish today are this. We're going to be able to define and find global maximums and minimums of a function. We talked about local minimums and local maximums before. Today your new term is going to be a global minimum and a global maximum. And we'll talk about what that means here in a little bit. Okay, and now we're going to talk about solving some optimization problems. And a lot of the solving optimization problems are going to go back to this idea of setting f prime of x equal to zero. Okay, so guys right here, just a little foreshadowing here what's coming up here. The largest and smallest values of a quantity often have practical importance in mathematics. Sometimes automobile engineers want to construct a car that uses the least amount of fuel. Uh, they want the maximum fuel efficiency in other words. Scientists want to calculate which wavelength carries the maximum radiation at a given temperature. Okay. Uh, city planners want to often design traffic patterns to minimize delays. So a lot of times we're looking about trying to minimize things like use least amount of fuel or calculate in this case we want to try and find out what gets us the maximum here or in this case right here what minimizes stuff so again we're going to be talking about certain values that are going to either get us a least a maximum or a minimum at some point that's going to go back again to this idea right up here f prime of x equals to zero so guys, when we start talking about problems like this in this context right here, such problems are going to belong to the field of mathematics called optimization. You're trying to get the most or the least possible out of what you have. So down here it says the single greatest or least value of a function f over a specific, I'm sorry, a specified domain is called the global maximum or minimum. Okay. So for instance, uh, if I would just come over here and well, we'll come back down here and talk about it, but the the global maximum down here is going to talk about f has a global minimum at p if f of p is less than or equal to all values of f. Basically a global minimum is the absolute lowest point on a graph. Okay, And then we would say f has a global maximum at p if f of p is greater than or equal to all values of f. This here is saying the global maximum is the absolute highest point. Okay. Now if you remember in the last section we talked an awful lot about uh, local minimums and local maximums and I'm just going to kind of jot this down in between here and we'll look at this in a graph here in a second but don't forget local minimums. It's possible for a local minimum which is like a valley point it's possible for a local minimum or a valley point to be your absolute lowest point. So it's possible that a local minimum could be a global minimum. And recall that local maximums could be some kind of a peak. Okay, So it's possible for a local maximum to also be a global maximum where it's the absolute highest point in there. Okay. Another theorem we're going to talk about here is going to be the extreme value theorem. A little bit of wordiness to this today, but I'll help you understand what it means. It says f is a continuous function on a closed interval from a to b. So a is some number here, b is some number here, right of a. And we're talking about all x values. If it's continuous, there's no breaks in the graph. So it starts at a, it ends at b, and there's no breaks in the graph. And it says f has a global maximum and a global minimum on that interval. Okay, so this graph right here is a great example of what we have here. For instance, we have a starting point. This would be like the A value, okay, and this would be the B value right here that we end at. And everywhere in between this graph is continuous from here to here, all right? So it says, how do we find global maximum and global minimums? Well, 
on a closed interval like this, we have a, a way we can test our possibilities here, okay? It says find all the critical points of F in the interval. So the critical points would be here, because that's going to be a place where the slope is zero. You would have a critical point right here, and a critical point right here where the slope is zero, okay? Now, within this graph right here, you can say, well, um, this has to be the global minimum. Even though this was a local minimum to begin with in that area, this has to be a global minimum because this is the absolute lowest point. All right. We say here that this is a local maximum. I can't say global because it's not the highest point, and this would be a local minimum. So this stuff here, well, it's all local here, or a local maximum here, local minimum here. This is also a local minimum, but it's also the global minimum because that's the absolute lowest point. Now. The other thing you need to test on a closed interval right here, guys, is this. You also need to look at the critical points and you also need to look at the endpoints, okay? Endpoints can never be local minimums or local maximums. They can only be globals, okay? So this particular point over here, one might think, well, this could be a local maximum because it's the highest point in that area. However, the, it's not really a critical point because the slope's not zero, okay? I can't say it's a global maximum either because there's higher points on here. Now this endpoint right here, although the slope is not zero, we could say, well, test that endpoint. That's the highest point in the graph. So this point would be a global maximum. So things to keep in mind, local and local stuff happens at peaks and valleys. Okay. However, this is an interesting one. Global minimums or maximums can happen. They can be the highest at a peak. They can be the lowest at a valley. Or they can be the highest or lowest at an end point. Okay. So you're going to hear me talk a lot about this section. Say, is that a local minimum, local maximum, or is that a global minimum or global maximum? And really, you're going to be testing points where you have a derivative equal to zero again. The only thing that you're going to add into this is, is adding some endpoints to see if those test out for you. Okay, and we'll look at some examples that deal with that here in a little bit. All right. Now, let's move on here. This open interval. On an open interval right here, so an interval that's kind of broken, or on all real numbers, it goes on forever. It says for a continuous function, find the value of f at all critical points. So we're worried about the critical points again to determine if those are minimums or maximums. And we can also sketch a graph of them. And I would say if you have to sketch a graph, I'd probably consider decimals for this. We'll also look at values of f when x approaches the endpoints on the interval. So for instance, up here we had an endpoint at point 0.2 right here, and we had an endpoint it looks like at about 1.1 maybe, somewhere in there. So we're going to look at um, endpoints on intervals and then if it approaches plus or minus infinity we're also going to look at what happens there okay it says if there's only one critical point look at the sign of f prime of x on either side or we could look at f double prime of x if you want to um, to determine concavity and determine if that's a minimum or maximum as well all right but guys really this section is very similar to the last one where we're still setting the first derivative equal to zero to find a critical point either here here or here and then determine which one is either a local minimum maximum or global minimum or maximum as we include the endpoints okay so let's go ahead and apply this example right here to finding global maximums and minimums on the following function um, our function is x cubed minus 9x squared minus 48x plus 52 on the following intervals. Now, kids, what part A is telling us right here is the following. They're saying, well, kids, here's the situation. We're only looking at the function in the window from negative 5 up to positive 12. So when I look at this window from negative 5 up to positive 12 here, All right. 
right, so I've got my little chart here that we'll work with on this here. Um, okay, so this first example that we're looking at is part A. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and graph this function real quickly, and we can easily see this in decimals if we needed to, and I've already kind of graphed this right here. What we're telling you right here is this, we're looking at this function on a closed interval, but we're looking at endpoints starting at negative 5 up to positive 12. So what I do know in this situation, kids, is the following. We know we're going to have endpoints. at 5 and at 12 okay we know we're gonna have endpoints at 5 and 12 now we also need to understand the critical points here as well and the critical points are gonna come from our first derivative set equal to 0 okay so let's just take a look at this real quickly all right critical points again come from that f prime of x equal to 0 so if you look at this function up here We've got the following function, f of x is x cubed minus 9x squared minus 48x plus 52. So if I took the first derivative right here, f prime of x, that uh, would get me 3x squared minus 18x minus 48 equals 0. Now again, this is a quadratic. I could go to that quadratic formula calculator. Uh, we kind of looked at this same function the other day in 5.1. I'm going to cheat this a little bit. I see that each term is divisible by 3, so I'm going to divide both sides by 3, which gets me x squared minus 6x minus 16 here equal to 0. Okay. Now, I know that this would factor into x minus 8 times x plus 2 equals 0. So my friends, we're going to have critical points at critical points at x equal 8 and at x equal negative 2. So the thing that we need to check out, and I've got a mistake up here, our endpoints were actually negative 5 and 12 up here. We need to understand, say, okay, we're looking at this interval from negative 5 up to 12. Do my critical points, first of all, fall within that interval? Well, if I check 8 right here, I say, yeah, 8's going to fall in up there. It would fit in there. So 8 would be a point I would check for either a local minimum, local maximum, or maybe possibly a global minimum or global maximum. And then the same question, is negative 2 going to fit in up there? And it does. So the points that we need to check in this function are the following. I'm not going to do all the math, but I'm going to tell you right now, what you would have to do is to plug negative 5 into this function, see what you get. Okay? You'd plug 8 into this function see what you get. You would plug negative 2 into this function, see what you get. You would plug 12 into this function and see what you get. And you'd have to go through. Now I've kind of cheated on this already. I've kind of done that already. Over here I have my function graphed. Now in decimals it's pretty cool because what you can do is come in here and type in your interval that you want right here. I'm going to click on that. That gives me this interval right here. We're looking at this function basically starting here on the left edge of the orange, negative 5. Follow that function all the way to positive 12. So we said check the critical points. We said we'd have a critical point at negative 2. And when you plug negative 2 into your original function, you're going to get that value 104 out. Okay, we also said we'd have a critical point at 8. And that gives you negative 396. Again, these points were in 5.1 already. Now, the other points we need to kind of check here are the following. We need to check the endpoints, and the endpoints in decimals are really pretty cool because it matches right up here on that dotted line. This point would be at 5, negative 58. So I'm sorry, if I plug negative 5 in here, you get negative 58 out. And if I plug 12 in here, well, you get negative 92. Now keep in mind, local minimums and local maximums can only happen at critical points, okay? But the idea here is not really find the local minimum or local maximum. They want the global minimums and global maximums. And in this case, in this interval in orange, my highest point is right here, negative 2, 104. And my lowest point is right here in that interval. Okay. So here's the situation. We would say, well, Parson, I think we have a global max. And I write G max like this. Don't be saying G money. G max at the point we said negative 2 I believe it was 104 in decimals yep so we've got a global max at negative 2 comma 104 and then we would have a global minimum well guys in this orange shaded region right here 
This is my lowest point in that orange shaded region at negative 396. So that's the lowest point right there, my friends. So your global maximum in that particular interval would be 8, comma, negative 396. So guys, when we're looking for global maximums or global minimums, we have to consider endpoints and we have to consider critical points. And that critical point comes again from setting your f prime of x, which was this function right here, equal to zero. Solve for your x values. Once you have your x values here, you need to see if it fits the interval up here. Okay. Now part b is the exact same problem. The only difference is this. We're evaluating at an endpoint of negative five. We're still going to have critical points eight and negative two, but this time we've got an endpoint at 14. So the points I'm really concerned about are negative five comma, oh, I can't remember what that was, negative 58, I think. Let me look here. Yep, negative 558, that's an endpoint at negative five. Okay, we gotta consider our, our uh, critical points, negative two comma, that was negative two, 104. Okay, we had eight, negative 396. And now the only difference here is this, instead of having an end point of 12, our X value ends at 14. So I'm just gonna jump here and say, well, I could plug 14 into this and get an answer out, but I'm gonna cheat this a little bit and save some time. In decimals, if I just change that interval from 12 to 14 up here, okay, I can see real easily that if I check on my graph here again then, so we had an endpoint here, we had that written down, this critical point, this critical point, and this right up here, 14 is at 360 now. So we would have a 14 comma 360 to check for a global maximum or minimum here. So go ahead and write this down here. That point was 14 comma 360. So these are my endpoints, and these are my critical points right here. So the question becomes, which one's the global maximum and which one's the global minimum? Well, guys, the highest value that shows up in here is 360, and the lowest value that shows up here is negative 396. So this must mean that 8, negative 396, this is a global minimum. And 14, 316 is a, I'm sorry, 14 comma 360 is a global max. Okay, so again, check your critical points, but you're also checking endpoints. All right, part C is the same thing. It's just gonna go on forever. So we're just gonna talk about X values greater than negative five. And if you kind of look at your graph here, you already know some of these points. This negative five didn't change. The critical points didn't change. So we're still dealing with the following points right here we're still dealing with negative five comma, negative 58 is what that was, Parson. Change that up there. Negative 58, we're dealing with negative two comma 104. And we can get really technical now if we want to here. This um, um, eight, negative 396. Now the thing that's different here, guys, is this, our end value is infinity. So we wanna talk about what happens to my graph or what's the end behavior when I let X go to infinity. Well, if you look at the graph over here, kids, if I go further and further to the right, the graph's gonna to continue to go up and up and up. So infinity going to the right is gonna yield positive infinity as an output or a Y value. This is what you're gonna end up with. So some things to think about here, kids. When I write these right here, I kind of like to let my top and bottom ones be an endpoint right here. And then my middle ones, if I have to, let them be critical points in between here. So guys, my lowest value on this right here is negative 396. Negative 396 is the lowest. This means this has to be the global minimum. Okay, then the highest Y value down here is infinity. So that has to be where the global maximum is we talk about these other points then, what are they? Well, critical points, if you have a critical point and it's not a global minimum or a global maximum, it can be a local minimum or local maximum. So if I go back in this case and look at negative two comma 104, negative two comma 104 is right here at a peak, all right? Not the highest point in the interval, because I can say, well, 
let's just look at this graph now. I can just say x is greater than negative 5, and that just keeps on going. However, this point right in here, that point right in there, in that area, that's the highest point at a peak. So I would say at negative 2, 104, that, my friends, is a local um, maximum. Now, this endpoint over here, I can't say that this is local because the slope's not zero there. Okay, so I can't say anything about this point. But this negative 2, 104, I could say, you know what? That there is a local maximum. I could have done the same thing right here, too. I guess at 8, this is a local maximum right here. Okay, over here, the two critical points were global, so it didn't matter. We didn't have to write anything on that. Okay. So guys, really, again, what you're testing, critical points, endpoints, or throw infinity in there and see what happens, which way is your graph going, and that'll help you with all that stuff, all right? Okay, example two. This one's going to start to get a little bit more difficult right here. Let's start to apply some of this idea. Again, the whole idea, set your first derivative equal to zero, test some endpoints. Let's see what we can come up with here, kids. Okay, example two talks about for a positive constant b, the surge function f of t is equal to t e to the negative bt gives the quantity of a drug in the body for a time t greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so the thing that you need to understand right here is this. This b value that's written up here, some number. It's like a three or a five or my favorite number six or however that has to work. Okay, and then t is the function that we're going to differentiate with respect to. It says find the global maximum and minimum of f of t for t greater than zero. So what we're really doing here, guys, is we're looking at all values of t greater than or equal to zero. We're basically looking at an interval where zero is my lowest value, all t values up to infinity. Okay? So we need to find a derivative of this, f prime of t. Oh, derivatives. This is why we took all those derivatives in chapter four. You have a product up here. Okay, you have t times e to the negative bt. Again, keep in mind, negative b, that's some number. So f prime of t, we need to find this. I don't know what it is. I know it's a product, so I'm going to let u equal t. That means u prime is equal to 1. And then I'm going to let v equal e to the negative bt, which means v prime will equal negative b e to the negative bt. So from this, again, we want f prime of t to equal zero. So what is f prime of t? Well, let's figure that out, okay? So from right here, f prime of t, u prime times v. u prime times v would be one times e to the negative bt. Again, we gotta find a global maximum. What t value maximizes or minimizes this? We've gotta set e. Oh, I didn't want that to be like that. Why, well, hang on a second, kiddos. All right, so we want e, f prime of t is going to be the following. It's going to be u prime times v, so it will equal e to the negative bt, plus uv prime. Okay, so I've got t times negative b e to the bt. What a mess. But that's okay. We'll figure this out. I'm going to change a sign right here. When I have... When I have uh, a t times this negative b e to the negative b t, this becomes the following. It really becomes minus t b e to the negative b t. Okay, keep in mind, v is some number, my friends. Okay, so we're gonna set that mess right here equal to zero. Now, if you notice right here in this, kids, I've got an e to the negative bt and an e to the negative bt that I could factor out of both of those. All right. So what we do here, kids, is we write this as e to the negative bt times, okay, if I took it out of here, you'd have a 1 left. And if I had a 1 left here, if I took it out of here, you'd have a minus tb. Okay, this is zero product. So I could set this part equal to zero or this part equal to zero. The nice thing about exponentials, there is nothing that you can put up here to make this equal to zero, all right? So this basically, I could divide both sides by e to the negative bt. 
and here's what we end up with. Here's what we end up with. We end up with 1 minus TB on the left equal to 0 on the right. And again, this was a function relative to T, so we're trying to find the T value that's going to work for us. Well, I'm going to add TB to both sides. I'll get 1 equals TB. And if I solve for T right here, we get T is equal to 1 over B. Okay. Now, is that a minimum or a maximum? I don't know. Okay. I don't really know. All right. But what I do know is if I took the second derivative and then plugged that value in, I would know if my value is positive or negative. Okay. So let's take the second derivative here. I don't know if I want to take the second derivative. Um, Okay, so let me switch colors of pens here. We'll talk about what we need to do here. So it says right now, once we figured out where a critical point is, again, this is where the derivative was equal to a zero. One over B, my friends, that is a critical point. So to find the global maximum and global minimums of this, here's what we're gonna have to do. Okay, we said this is gonna work on the interval from zero up to infinity, and then we've got this point, one over B in there. So we've gotta test this for zero comma something we got to test this for 1 over b comma something. We've got to test this for infinity. Whoops. we got to test this for an infinity. Okay. All right, so I'm putting my endpoints in. We only found one critical point to this. So let's check this out, kids. Understand, b is some positive constant number. b is some positive number. Let's plug 0 into the function up here. Uh, if I plug 0 in for t, 0 times e to the negative b times 0. 0 times e would make that 0 already. So we're already at a point 0 comma 0 when I plug that into this function up here. Again, we're plugging in for t. Okay, now this one's an interesting one. When I plug 1 over b into this, I'll do the work up here. In for t, I'd plug in 1 over b. 1 over b. Um, that takes the value of this t value right here. And then we've got e to the negative b times the t value for my critical point that we plugged in, 1 over b. Oops. Okay. Um, friends, this is a mess. 1 over b times negative b is negative 1. This is like 1 over b times e to the negative 1, which is equal to 1 over some positive value, b, e. So. It's going to be pretty close to zero, but not quite zero. So I'm going to have one comma b e here. And then if we plug infinity in here, well, kids, it's kind of the same thing, but we're going to have infinity when I plug t in here, infinity over e to really the negative infinity, but this is going to dominate. This is a mess. This is going to be the infinity t that we plug in. And then I'm going to put this e to the negative bt in the bottom is e to the bt. This is going to be infinity, or I'm sorry, this is going to be e to the b times infinity power. Okay, This is just some number up here, infinity. This is an exponential function. This would dominate this. So something over something that's much bigger is going to get really, really close to zero. So I'm going to say it's going to get so close to zero, but it's just not going to get there. Okay, so the question becomes, where are your global maximums and global minimums? Well, here you're at zero. This will be your global minimum. This is going to be some positive value, but it's going to be bigger than this because this is just going to keep getting closer and closer to zero the further right I go. And if I wasn't sure, I have this graph here. We can take a look at this here. Uh, in decimals, I just kind of threw B in to be a slider for our function here. And you can kind of see right here that we're looking at the interval starting at zero. This is always going to be zero, zero. This is where that maximum occurs, like 1 over b, whatever that b value would be, if you did that. And then and our b value would be, I don't know in this case. Um, but over here, you can see that this is just going to keep getting closer and closer to 0. So this must be where your 1 over b is right here. Okay, now I like this next one right here. It says find a value of b to make a maximum of 10. And I can't remember how that worked. I think I just had zero. No. Point 0.1. 
All right, let's take a look at this, kids. It said, last part of the question goes on to say this. I should back up here. This here would have been a global maxim at that critical point. And again, this is a pretty tough concept, all right? The idea that there's no numbers in here makes it tricky. It says, next, find the value of B making T equal 10, the global maximum. Well, guys, we just found the global maximum right here to occur at 1 over B. one over b comma b e so we know that the x value we know that the x value is going to be one over b so it says find the value of b making t equal 10 the global maximum okay well guys this is pretty simple we have this function they're telling you that t is going to be the highest point in the graph so if i go back up to my function right here we're really kind of looking at f of 10 we're saying well I want f of 10 to be the maximum point, okay? But f of 10 is going to be the maximum point. When t is 10, that's where your derivative is going to equal 0, okay? Where t is 10, that's where your derivative is going to equal 0. So we come to this point right here. We say, well, my derivative of 0, f prime of t, equal to e to the negative bt minus tbe to the negative bt is equal to zero here. My friends, we got down to this part right here. We said, well, to make this equal to zero, we got to one minus tb was equal to zero. They're telling you that 10 is gonna get you a maximum value. What number of b or what value of b is gonna make that true? So we come into this where my derivative was equal to zero to solve this. We would have this one minus tb is equal to zero. That meant that at t equal 10 is where the maximum would be. That's what they want it to be. We would simply plug 10 in for this. We would say, okay, 1 minus 10b has to equal 0, which means 1 equals 10b. So this would imply that b would have to equal 0.1. And if you look at the graph right here that I plugged in here, if I go ahead and let b equal 0.1 right here, and you click on the graph, you can see that there's a point up here that they give you as a maximum. And that maximum happens at 10 comma 3.679. So if you go in here, it says find the value of B making that a global max. B would have to be 0.1. All right, guys, example three, pretty much the same thing again. It says when you cough, your windpipe contracts. It says the speed V of R with which you expel air depends on the radius R of your windpipe. So we're going to assume that R is a positive number. The radius of your windpipe should be a positive value. If the radius of your windpipe is negative, uh, that's not good. Okay. It says if A is the normal rest radius of your windpipe, then for 0, less than or equal to R, less than or equal to A, the speed is given by the following function. Okay. Your velocity is going to equal to some constant k. Again, k is some positive number. All right, so I'm going to underline this. A is going to be your resting radius of the windpipe. So k and a are going to be some number that uh, are, are positive constants minus r times r squared, where k is a positive constant. It says, what values of r maximize the speed? And for what value is the speed minimized? Okay. So the first thing I want you to understand is this. This is our interval from zero up to A. All right, all those R values could be critical points. Zero and A are gonna be endpoints. So I'm gonna write this down. Zero and A will be endpoints. Okay, so we might have to consider zero and A as possibilities to give us a maximum or a minimum. Okay, but we also need to look for critical points. So we know that V of R is equal to a mess here. And I'm going to change V of R right here, kids. I'm going to distribute K into all of this here. And I'm going to distribute R squared into all of this here. Okay. So what we get here is K times A times R squared when I do this. All right. Um, if I take the K times everything first, we've got K times A minus KR times R squared first. 
And then from there we'll distribute again. B sub r is going to equal to k a r squared minus k r cubed. Now keep in mind, kids, again, k and a are what kind of variables? Well, they're actually constants. They're some number. They're like a 3 and a 7. Okay? So we're going to worry ourselves about v prime of r. So here we go, v prime of r. This is going to help us find critical points. Pull a 2 out front. We're going to have 2 k a r to the first by power rule minus 3 k r squared. And we're going to set this equal to 0. Okay. Now kids, in uh, this right here, I've got a k common with this, and I've got an r common with this. So we could factor out a kr from both. Okay, and so what we have is a zero product right here, which implies we could set kr equal to zero. So if I set, and I'll make a little t chart here, I could set kr equal to zero. Any r value that would work would be zero. Well, that's good because if you recall up here, if you recall up here, oops, zero was one of the endpoints, so that makes sense to us. I could also set the 2a minus 3r equal to zero. And we're going to solve for r here. So I would set 2a equal to 3r. So in this case, the other r value would become 2a divided by 3. So the points we need to test, what points are we testing for minimums and maximums? Well, we said 0 up to a, and then we've got basically 2 thirds of a. 2 thirds a would fall between 0 and 1a. So we've got an endpoint at 0 to test. We've got a critical point at 2 thirds a, or 2a over 3. And we've got another crit or I'm sorry another endpoint at a all right so let's test these out oops don't know why it did that but it was pretty cool all right let's go back up to our original function original function was right here we want 0 to be our r value okay well if i took a minus 0 you would have a times k times 0 squared okay Guys, if your radius of a windpipe is zero, that means you're not breathing. Therefore, no air is coming out. So the velocity of that is zero. Okay, This is not a good situation. All right. The next one right here. Let's go to the other endpoint and test A right here. Let's go ahead and use this function again. I'll write some work up here. Uh, I'm going to let the R value be 2A over 3. So this is going to become K times A minus 2 thirds A. That's what I replaced that r with, times 2 thirds a to the second. That was one value, okay? This becomes k times, this would be 1 third a in parentheses. And then this would multiply or square out to be 4 ninths a, okay? So kids, if I combine all that or multiply that all together, the 4 times the 9, the 4 times the 9, my friends, would be, I'm sorry, the 4 times... The one up top would be 4, and the 3 times 9 at the bottom would be 27. So this would be 4 27ths. And then a squared k. Now again, guys, a and k are positive values, so this is going to be some number higher than 0. All right? And then let's plug this other endpoint of a into our function. So I'm going to have k times a minus a times a squared. Right here, that a minus a is going to be 0. So 0 times anything else. Okay. So the speed would be 0 at a normal resting rate. Okay. So, guys, here's what we end up with what's global maximum, what's global minimum? For what value of r maximizes the speed? The value of r that's going to maximize the speed would be two-thirds of your resting radius. 
and then a radius of A just means you're resting. This would get you a minimum. Resting radius of A would get you zero velocity, so this would be when you're resting. And then if your windpipe is zero, this just means you're dead. No air is moving either. So at, at your radius of R, this would also get you a minimum as well. And I can say that these are global minimums because they both kick out the same velocities. Okay, kids, last example here. All right, it says when an arrow is shot into the air, its range R is defined as a horizontal distance from the archer to the point where the arrow hits the ground. If the ground is a horizontal and we neglect air resistance, it can be shown that capital R, your range, is equal to V sub O squared times sine of 2 theta over G, where V sub O is initial velocity. So V sub O is going to be an initial velocity, so some number or a constant of the arrow. G is the acceleration due to gravity. That's a constant, so this will be some number. And theta is going to be the angle above the horizontal. So you can talk about this here. You know, you're talking about a person that's maybe standing here. They're going to shoot an arrow up in the air. They're either going to shoot it straight. They can shoot it here. They don't want to shoot it straight up right here. So we're talking about basically zero radians being over here straight this way. And we're talking about pi over 2 radians being up here. So this archer is going to shoot this a certain range, certain distance this way, based on the angle that it goes up in the air and then comes back down like so. Okay, we're trying to find the angle that's going to maximize this range right here. All right. So kind of the same thing again kids. The thing you need to understand here is that V sub O and G are going to be some constant. Okay, V sub O squared, that would be a number. G, that would be some number. This is like 2 squared over 7. Okay, that's just going to stay a constant out here. Then the derivative of your sine, that's going to be cosine 2 theta, but we would have to use the chain rule. You'd have to multiply by 2 here. So here's what we're going to get. This is what angle of theta maximizes my range. So here's what we're going to have, kids. We're going to have r prime equal to the following. Okay. I know that this is a constant right here. V sub O squared over G is a constant. So I'm going to leave this as V sub O squared over G times the derivative of sine of 2 theta. Well, kids, the derivative of sine is cosine 2 theta times the derivative inside here. Well, the derivative of 2 theta would be a 2, so I'm going to put that out front here. So here's our derivative, kids. We get 2 V sub O squared over G times the cosine of 2 theta. Now, to figure out what's going to maximize this, we've got to set this equal to 0. Okay. So we have 2 V sub O squared all over G times the cosine of 2 theta equal to 0. And we got to solve for theta to make this work. So what I'm going to do here, kids, is I'm going to multiply both sides by g over 2 v sub o squared. Keep in mind, g and v sub o, there's some number. Don't know what they are. But here's the deal. This would cancel. And you would have the cosine of 2 theta equal to, oh, over here you've still got 0 times a mess. So now we got to figure out what this is. So we're going to do the inverse of both sides. If I do the inverse of this side, cosine inverse of the left, we just get 2 theta. That would equal the cosine inverse over here of 0. I have a unit circle open for this. And again, when we talked about our range being from 0 to pi over 2, well, pi over 2 is in radians. So if I go to my chart here, I've got it on the website. It says unit circle on it. I want to know what the cosine inverse of 0 is. So I'm going to jump in here. We're only working from 0 to pi over 2. So guys, where is the cosine equal to 0? Happens to be at... 
pi over 2. So the cosine inverse of pi 0, cosine inverse of 0 takes me back to pi over 2. So right here, friends, oops, come on. This would be equal to pi over 2. And that would still equal 2 theta over here. If I divide both sides by 2, this gets you theta is equal to pi over 4. Right? Now, I'll just tell you right here, if you would go ahead and look at your points then, my endpoints are going to be at 0 and pi over 2. And then we're going to have to consider pi over 4 as a value. We'll have to consider pi over 4 as a value. So I'm going to do some work over here on the side. You can find some room to write this over there, kids. So on my notes over here, hang on one second here, kids. I'm going to do this. I hope I can do this. Make myself a little bit of extra room here. There we go. So I'm going to look at endpoints at, say, 0. And then we're also going to look at pi over 2. Don't know why this is doing that. Okay, go back to this. I'll start this over again. So we're going to look at endpoints of 0 and pi over 2. And everything's decided to freak out all of a sudden. Give me one second. Okay, so we're going to look at those points again. We're going to look at 0, because that was one end value. We're going to look at pi over 2, because that was another end value in the interval. But we also found this critical point at pi over 4, so we're going to check that out. We're going to say which one gets us maximum range. Okay, so here we go. We're going to go into this right here. For 0, we would plug 0 in for theta. Kids, this would become the sine of 0. And if you go into my chart again, sine of 0, sine of 0 degrees or 0 radians, going to be 0. So... I plug 0 in up here, sine of 0 is 0. 0 times v sub o squared over g is still going to be 0. So if you shoot at 0 degrees, the range is going to be 0 distance horizontally. Okay, Let's plug in pi over 4. If I go sine of 2 times pi over 4, the sine of 2 times pi over 4, this would become the sine of pi over 2 when you double pi over 4. Sine of pi over 2 is 1 sine of pi over 2 is 1, so you would have 1 times v sub o squared over g, so when you have pi over 4 in there, you would have v sub o squared over g as your distance. Okay, keeping in mind that if these are positives, that went some positive distance down here. And then if you plug pi over 2 in here, I'll just make this short and sweet for you. 2 pi, or I'm sorry, 2 times pi over 2 would be 1 pi. The sine of 1 pi is 0. So if you shot the arrow straight up, it would come straight back down. It wouldn't go any distance, so it makes sense that that's zero. So the question is, what the angle of theta maximizes are? The only one where we get something other than zero is right here. So your theta equal to pi over four maximizes range. Kids, we're not going to worry about example five. Um, we'll, uh, you can cross this one off down here if you want to do that. I don't think we're going to worry about anything like that until later. So again, uh, the good news is I get to come back on Monday. Uh, I'm excited about that. I was hoping to be back for this lesson today and uh, unfortunately not, but uh, uh, keep plugging away, get the notes down. When I get back, we'll certainly work on getting caught up on some things, but uh, you guys are doing a great job and um, can't wait to see you soon. If you have questions again, uh, just remind you, email me, 
if you do have questions and uh, um, I'd be happy to set up a Google Meet or email 